Welcome back to the Phasing Line podcast. I mean, the show where we record biannually. I am Marty Casey, one CWF, or dare I say it, KR1DX. We'll get into that in a little bit. Mm. And I'm Sterling in 0SSC. And I don't have any other special call sign because I haven't operated a lick, except for our company did like an emergency, did a tornado drill. So we had like an emergency net. So I got on the air for that, but that's been about it. <laughs> been pretty lazy in terms of ham radio lately, but there's been a lot of good updates and you've been doing a lot of stuff too. I've been busy as heck, but I have been active and it's good to be back here. Last time we put out an episode, it was the bull session, which we'll talk about a little bit later now that the survey has officially closed. We have a lot to talk yeah, about tonight. It's... Yeah, there, I mean, a lot of time has passed, and I'm sure all of you are wondering, where's the giveaway? Well, let me tell you, uh, the giveaway had one, a total of one entry, and it would only be fair to give it to that one entry, and you know who you are, but also, we should probably extend it out to more of our listeners, and you and I can figure out some new rules or, or stick to the old rules, which is you had to be less than the age of 25. Maybe you can say like age 30 or age 40 or something. How about just anybody anywhere? <laughs> or just anybody. See, I, I still want to give like somebody uh, younger a an incentive. Um, but if we want to like extend it out to our listeners, which we appreciate all listeners, that's true. Like we should probably give it out to everybody. So... If that How sounds about good. This? How about this? If you're under 25, you will get the gift that Sterling has provided. If you are over 25, you will get a piece of memorabilia from my shack. Ooh, what would that be? I don't know yet, but I will make sure you get know. something. I will make sure <laughs> that you get something out of my bone here. Maybe it's like a 67 puff glass cap. Maybe it's a headset. Maybe it's. <laughs> it'll end up being like an old soda can or something. They'll be so no, disappointed. No, I have lots of. Maybe it'll be a control box. You and I will chat when I when uh, you and me and the winner will chat. All right. Um, but you know, you could enter either way. Um, shoot us an email. Contact at phasinglinepodcast dot com. Give us your name, your call sign, and your age. Make sure you check that email. We'll announce the winner on the show in a couple of weeks. I guess we will say, let's keep this open until April 1st. Okay. April Fool's Day will close this. We said that last time. Also, one of the reasons why we didn't have an episode um, on the 2nd of March, which was what we were originally going to do. It's already the 14th of March. Good grief. Happy Pi Day, by the way. 3.14159. Something, something. Six, I had five. Pi today. Um, I, I wrote a very funny comment on or what I thought was funny. Nobody else found it amusing on pod, on uh, on Facebook. Uh, that today was pi in parentheses e day. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, I said not pi times e for the record, which is approximately 8.54. Um, and if you're nerdy, you got that joke. <laughs> I wonder and how many people have figured it out by now. If you're not nerdy, then you're probably just lost. Hint, both are quite irrational. Very irrational. And I'm not talking about numbers. I'm talking about Marty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. So, He's yeah, no. Anyway, the 2nd of March was actually Justin's birthday. So we had a fun day with her. Um, I should have known better. Um, Justin, my fiance, if, uh, if you haven't listened to the previous episodes. But so everybody wish her a happy 25th birthday. The big 2-5. Yeah. And now we're the same age. We're quarter century. Um, different quarter century. I, I was I realized that there's a quarter century wireless association, and that is not for CW operators who are age 25. It's for CW operators, or I guess all operators. I think it's mostly a CW club who have been in the hobby for at least 25 years. So I'm a bit young for that. Has it been a decade for you? No, it's oh yeah, it's been about a decade. I actually have to renew my license next year. Um, so I, or maybe this year. I'm going to look it up now because now I'm Talk, probably going to. Probably going to renew it, or are you going to give it up? Yeah, I'm going to renew it, of course. I, I wish I could get a um, a new call sign, like a like a one by 2 but I'm so used to N0SSC, um, and I still love it on CW, and, you know, if I'm honest, I'm going to lose that brand if I get rid of that call sign, and I'm going to lose... It's like changing your name, and I really, you know, I really just like the call sign. Even if, even if I move somewhere... It's a good call sign on... Um 
The only GW? downside is is zero is five dashes, which is the longest. Um, it, it, you have you have a very dashy call, a yeah. very dashy call. But the SSC has a really good rhythm. It's like it's got a beat to it. So I always say it like bust through DX pileups. But uh, but it's like it's mine. I used to be KD zero BZE, which. Ugh. Probably need phonetics just to say that over the over a Bravo literally a microphone. Zulu Echo. It was bad. It was bad on CW. So I'm glad I got that change. But yo, I got to every it time in I 2018. every time I hear uh, an E as the last let uh, character on CW, the call sign magically shortens. Oh yeah, because the E gets lost in the noise. You know, you can, it, or, you can lose or it gets a combined with a letter. Like if right. it's I E, then it sounds like S. Or if it's W zero E E E, then that just throws everybody off because right. you you have to space out your dits like dit dit dit. E E E can magically else, become an S. You know? It'll become an S or an I E or an E I or a A or a, a, a G. Oh, not a G, but like I don't know. It'll it'll. I I got and my my state is Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and which is under a bunch of snow right now. Which is under a crap ton of snow. Yeah. Uh, but the ARRL CW contest, your exchange is your state. Everybody and I I sent it pretty sloppy by uh, with a with a paddle one year. Everybody said five nine Q. What's that? <laughs> uh, if you got if the if you got the joke, you can laugh at me. Um, because M A da da da, 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 da 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 is Q. Sorry, I ruined it for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of call signs, so I'm a member of a club slash like one of three members slash like whatever you want to call it. Um, and we just got a new club call sign. Kello Radio 1 Delta X-Ray. KR1DX. Curdix. Um, which I really like the call. Let me take that back. I re- super really like it. Mm-hmm. First of all, it has a weird prefix, which will be great for the WPX contest. Yeah, which you, which is you get more points for having a funnier, or people, getting people funny want prefixes. You, people want to work you. you Unique know, prefixes are like multipliers. Um, yeah, um, prefixes are multipliers in that contest. Gotcha. Um, and I think it's a pretty snappy call sign. Kilo Radio 1 Delta X-Ray. Any call sign with a DX in the end kind of sounds cool. Yeah, it's like kind of the, or CQ or, uh, well, I guess CQ is like confusing because it can be like KR1CQ, CQ, CQ, KR1, CQ. It's like, is your call sign just KR1? It's also like, (laughs) it's like the people who on CW have call signs that end in a K. Yeah. Um, yeah, because then, because normally you end a CW exactly. call in K, da da da, meaning okay. Um, you talk now. You talk now. Or BK or uh, what's the other SK. one? QN or KN, which means only you talk. But yeah, if you end in a K, it can get confused. Like you can get the last letter dropped off the call sign and it'll mess you up. But you figure it out. But it makes um normally it doesn't happen in contests because you never send K at the end of exchange, do you? You just kinda like no. stop and then they go. Yeah. Because that takes up time. That's that's an unnecessary kind of redundant character for a contest exchange. But a normal like rag chewy, right. DXing, that sort of stuff, it's like it can it can get troublesome. Yeah. I'm not an expert to talk about that. <laughs> Thinking about I'm not an expert. So much for these awkward transitions today. Um <laughs> We kind of sat down with a bunch of experts um, last episode, which we were kind of hinting at earlier. We did the bull session mm-hmm. um, for Ham Radio Now and Ham Talk Live. And I thought that was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was really cool to have um, Neil Rapp and, as well as the Ham Talk Now or Ham. It was it's Radio really Now, now. Ham, Ham Talk Radio Live. Now, Ham Talk Live, Phase Online Podcast. Ours, I'm glad ours is so different because, yeah. you know, you can set us from the noise, but. That was really fun. We had um, Gary, we had Dave, I think it's uh, uh, W0DHG, Dave Greenberg. David, Gold, David. Goldberg. David Goldenberg. Goldenberg. And uh, uh, Neil Rapp, WB1, uh, crap. WB9, WB9, VPG. That's VPG. a tongue twister. So bad with call signs. So everybody and, knows those guys from those things, especially Neil Rapp from Ham Radio Newsline and Ham Talk. Amateur Live. Radio Newsline. You are so, on a busting... <sighs> I know. Roller coaster. I, I'm I've busted every call sign in this whole podcast right now. <laughs> but we talked about things. We didn't just kind of yak. We talked about 
a project that a committee of the AWRL has been working on. Right. The licensing survey. And you should go back and listen to it. It's really long, but if you have any vested interest in the licensing survey and um, the AWRL put out, which is basically asking hams, asking um, the, the ham radio population if it's a good idea to have a entry license. Now, there used to be the novice license, the the advanced, then the tech and general extra. You know, we talked all about it in the history of it, and it kind of eludes me. But the idea is, right now, it's kind of hard for people to get into the hobby, even with the technician license. So some, what if we, some people say it's hard to get into the hobby. Right. So what if we um, had an entry-level license, uh, like a foundation or a basic or a novice? Bring back the novice. So... Um, we had a big, long discussion about it. We won't go into our opinions here because we talked about them there. It's an incentive to go check it out. Ham Talk Now. Dang it. Ham Radio Now, Ham Talk Live. But, uh, well, Ham Radio Now has has it in video form, so you can watch Flapping Heads talk, but our internet was really bad, so it's like our it's our really like- open for like five <laughs> minutes and then closed. But it sounds fine. And then we also have it on our podcast. Our very last episode was you know co-hosting. Uh, so... It was really cool, and it was really good to have Neil on there because he's a teacher. He's an educator of ham radio um, uh, licensing he classes. How people learn, so he's really into um, training. And then you have David, who's an MCOM trainer, um, if I remember correctly. And so he's really into that side of things. So they're both. So everybody, and then us two younger people. Everybody was like basically a stakeholder in this whole debate. So it was really good to hear, yeah. and. I don't think we really answered questions. Like we all had differing opinions, so there was never closure. There was never we should have one or we should not, or we should um, reduce like the, the right. license pool or reduce the number of questions. But um, in the end, it was still like a really good conversation. I think nobody had anything really stupid to say, except probably you guys would argue me. But um, I thought it was a lot of fun. Let us know what you think of these collabs. Do you like them? Yeah. Is it, is it enough of us? Too much of us? <laughs> it was definitely long, so I'm sure people were like going to sleep, but... It was probably me who talked them to sleep. <laughs> That's not true. You you actually talked quite a bit. I kind of fell asleep at some points, but uh, I, I stayed in the background um, while you guys had some really good conversation. I, I should have piped yeah. up more, but... Um, but man, when you get some passionate people in the same room, it's like it's like you have we had what five hams there or four hams, no five, five hams, twenty opinions, and that many opinions. Because I would say like one thing, and then I'd be like, oh, actually, I think this thing is better. But you know, and and you know, that's that's really cool. Well, we don't need to tell you what we talked about because you could go listen to what. we Yeah, talked like about. I said, so um, check that out on the very last episode. Kind of to give a kind of to update on that. Uh, unbeknownst to us, I thought the survey was going to be going on for quite some time. Um, but apparently the survey is actually already closed. Yeah. I mean, it went to the, the licensing survey website. If you just Google eight overall license survey, it said, thanks for your responses. And there wasn't a way to enter the survey again. So, and, and I mean, it's been up for a while and it's been talked about a lot. Um, but I but didn't I, I can't. see where it was supposed to close. And like, I, I also thought it was supposed to be open for a while too. Yeah. Make sure it's not that just your browser had a cookie or something. Um, but I don't know. I hope, I hope they are willing to publish the data. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm sure they will. Like, we'll see what happens. Um, they're probably going to make a licensing change out of it. I, I would imagine because well, I mean, there's such a lot of talk about it. There, whether, whether it's, um, you know, a well, license, a new license, or a so, small license you change. So the first thing is whatever. the survey is still open. Um, it's not closed. Oh. Um. You have to scroll down to the bottom of your, the page to enter your thing, um, uh, enter your data. And the other thing is that, um, you know, I, it's it's not concrete like that. The AWRL doesn't change the licensing. Uh, the AWRL does not have a hundred different special powers. Um, they can submit a proposal for rulemaking, as can anybody else. Um, and there's actually other people who are doing similar things because they're so sick and tired of all the AWRL politics mm-hmm. uh, who are just kind of running, th- floating their, all, uh, yeah. their own boat. Yeah, it's kind of um, hard to go through the, the you know, regular any, Anybody can jump bureaucracy. through those hoops. Um, uh, and I support anybody. I don't think the AWRL should have a, mo- a monopoly, and uh, I don't think the AWRL intends to do that either. So um, I just wanted to make it clear that there's no... 
the NRL doesn't wave its hands and say, uh, Poof, you know, here's a new license. Yeah, they have to yeah. pay for the FCC, which, you know, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. But they, the they still the represent, government. like, they, they they have 200,000 members, but they represent seven. They, they represent every single hand I don't to think the FCC. They, I don't think they have 200,000 members. I thought it was a number closer to 40,000. Oh, no, it's very, very high. I got to look it up now. I'm pretty sure it's in like the forty fifty thousand range. Um, I could be wrong. Um, but either way, they're they're coming up with some interesting data. They're exploring what other hams have to say. They're exploring how hams kind of feel about it, and it'll be interesting to say. There's see, uh, I've seen on the social medias. There's been a lot of hams who are kind of like, no, we don't want to make the the licenses easier. You know, we have uh, these QRMers on our repeaters stealing our frequencies. This is very bad. You took away the code. Look at all these idiots. Um, and somebody did an analysis, which I always point to when people speculate about this stuff, which was that like 60 or 70 percent of all uh, malicious interference on the hand bands is caused by old folkies who pass their 30, bar- 30 or 20 word a minute code test and have their extras. I mean, um, that's just that's just a sign of like they were an extra whenever they had to take the code test. Right. And right. It's. It's like, I mean, you can say that and say one thing and look up this thing, but at the bottom line, every hobby has, you know, poo heads, has like terrible people and has like annoying um, operators. Or, I mean, I don't know if you would call like a car enthusiast a car operator, but, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's that's like, it's, it's like it is everywhere. I mean, you go to like Airsoft forums and you go to uh, coin collecting forums, there's a lot of elitism everywhere you go. And so people yeah. think that their hobby is, you know, has, as it should be to each your own, but it's really, it really sucks when they start like trying to, you know, evangelize their position that it's better than somebody else's, but there's no better, you know, thing unless you're actively being anti-progressive. I feel like, I feel like the hobby is founded on technical advancement and, and you know progression of radio technology. So if you're, and I'm not saying like if you run a boat anchor and you run CW that you're not being progressive, but if you're limiting the enjoyment of the hobby to others, that's like that's what I'm talking about. Like don't do that. Right. Um. And you were so we are both started wrong. So it seems like. Uh, the number is closer to like 150,000, 161,000. Uh, right now, if you go to slash awrl dash fact dash sheet, ARL fact sheet, it says the AWR has over 170,000 members as of 2016 January. And Wikipedia says 160,000, so somewhere in there. Yeah, so, but like I said, they represent 700,000 hams in the U.S., 750,000 hams or so. Even though they're, you know, only a proportion of that, because they are, they are the biggest club, the biggest lobbying agency that we have, and they are the 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 boots on the ground when it comes to radio spectrum. Well, Sterling, I guess one of the things that happens when we haven't done a podcast in a while is that kind of current events pass, and you don't really get to talk about them. But I will bring up something that I did. Um, I guess it was two weeks ago now, was the ARRL uh, DX Sideband Contest, which is arguably the second biggest phone contest of the contesting calendar. Um, And the first big phone contest of 2017. And let me say, it was absolutely 100% completely awesomely terrible. Oh my. Well, what Um, happened? Conditions were awful. We had some station issues. Uh, we had S9 plus 20 dB line noise in all bands, uh, but mainly and we had some antenna issues, but mainly conditions were hel- uh, terrible. Um, and let me just give you a little bit of a reference here. Um, arguably one of the biggest names in HF contesting in the U.S. is K3LR. Uh, that's Tim Duffy out in West Middlesex, Pennsylvania. Uh, they have 12 radios in a room and they do multi-multi contesting with two radios on each band. Arguably one of the best stations in North America. Yeah, they're up there with like W3LPL and K9CT. But K9CT is a little bit below them, but K3LR and yeah. W3LPL are kind of the. They big still two. have a literal, literally an antenna farm, like like dozens like, of towers. I don't think dozens, dozens of radios, dozens, dozens of, of radios. antennas, dozens yeah. of radios. Yes, you can exactly. have a lot of people on the air at the same time. Um, and just to give you a comparison, when this contest goes well. Uh, 
uh, the ARRL contest, that is, uh, these stations can put up access of 20 million points. Uh, the operators are that good. They can do over 20 million points in the weekend and when conditions are very good. Um, and when conditions are bad, they do less, obviously. Um, but this weekend, conditions were really bad. Um, so bad that instead of the 20 million that they normally make, they made less than six and a half million. Wow. Uh, and W3 LPL, who typically makes over 20 million points himself, made less than five and a half million points. Uh, they normally make well over 12,000 QSOs, um, typically significantly more. Um, they made only, uh, I think it was in the 4,000 QSO range. Um, in other words, conditions were very, very bad. So is it a matter of conditions or is it a matter of like actual people on the air? Like, conditions. Or, or is condi- it both? It's like, complete. There, were, there was the same people that are there every year in the chairs. Yeah, because um, I imagine we don't know when the logs will be. I mean, we won't know until the logs are submitted exactly how many operators there were. There wasn't a lack of activity. There just was a lack of conditions. I'm pretty confident in that. Hmm. Um, I mean, yeah. Hmm. Um, and uh, there was there was a big solar storm with no sp- no sunspots. Yeah. Uh, so there was basically no 10 meters, um, and very very little. Uh, uh, 15 meters. It was only barely open to Europe on Saturday. When I mean barely open, I mean it was very hard to work any Europeans using stacked eight element monobanders on a two hundred foot tower. Um, <laughs> in other That's words, actually crazy because normally it's pretty easy to work Europeans on a very modest tower antenna dipole, even you know. I'll tell you about fifteen meters, uh, which at this point in the sun cycle is harder and harder and harder. Right, we're we're getting to the very minimum, and then lately, like you said, there's been zero sunspots, which sunspots are the indicator of how good propagation is. And if there's no sunspots, there's no solar activity, and there's no ionospheric ionizing, and then there's no propagation. So some, I guess that's what was going on. Huh? Yeah, um, and we had S nine line noise to couple uh, with that. So our score, we are multi single. Uh, we came in second place in North America, I believe, at this time. And uh, we scored just under 2 million points uh, when last year the win- the winner scored over 6 million points. Um, and they won kind of due to a lack of other serious entries. Uh, we, um, we had two radios set up in band, um, uh, locked out together, uh, so we could be combing multipliers on a band while the other station was calling CQ. Um, and even with that, because the conditions were just so bad, um, it was a very pitiful weekend. We did uh, less than 2,000 QSOs when we can typically do well over six. Wow. Um, it was pretty pathetic. Well, that's no good. Glad I didn't get on the air to go through that nightmare. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I went to Nashville so it, so and uh, went to the Country Music Hall of Fame for Justin's birthday. So that was a lot of fun. But apartment life, no antennas here, no contesting. So... I mean, I also haven't been really diligent. Like, oh, I have no radios that actually transmit right now. They're all, for some reason, in non-transmitting state, which, if you've been listening for every episode, I think I complained that in about 90% of the uh, <laughs> in the episodes we've had. So, you used oh, well. to get on the air W0 Triple E, but they had right. a fire. So what's going on there now? Yeah, so everything is better than expected. Actually, everything is, is really, really popping off. It's It's been really good for the Triple E Club. Uh, Aaron Boots and um, Barry Preston and uh, let's see Clayton. I forget all the you know I forget Clayton call signs, but Aaron A zero R N and KC zero Y D Z um, have been doing a lot of work for the Triple E Club. <clears throat> First of all, they're back into their club room in G twenty nine in the Double E Emerson Hall building. They laid down the floors, got new ceiling tile, painted the walls, and now they're putting all their stuff back into the shack. Um, and trying to set up a new layout. So that's really cool. And um, they also had uh, a huge licensing class. They had 23 people come to a class, and they got 23 people licensed, I think. So so the actual statistics is um, the Rolla Missouri, which is the VE team, that the, the RARS, Rolla Regional Amateur Radio Society, administered 41 exams to 23 examinees and on their website they have the whole list of who upgraded who got a new license this and that so i haven't gotten counted but super successful so now they have a huge club the group me chat is super lit all the time now 
Um, I actually met one of the guys, uh, Gav, and he came up for um, to meet me at Gateway Electronics, which is like a little electronics store that's staffed by a ham and a, uh-huh. an electronics electronics wizard, and they just have random piece parts. So it's kind of like a um, a uh, a digi key, but you know, there's it's not online. You have to actually go there, so that's pretty cool. Everything's like sorted, and, and there's no ham. There's ham radio books, but there's no actual ham radio stuff. You can connectors and power pole stuff, and, and coax wires, and everything like that. Um, capacitors, resistors, all that. Everything that Radio Shack had when they were a thing in the seventies. Um, now there, so that was cool. And so, and then the tower. I don't think they're doing much to the tower now. They're probably just going to end up leaving it as is. There's no damage that they know of that they can speak of but um right now they're doing some modeling and analysis to try to install a tilt over tower so that they can actually do work on the antenna uh, because that's the big problem we installed it they installed a antenna a log periodic or we as in me and uh the the club in 2014 we installed a tenadine t8 and it broke in gravity like it got to, down to freezing and i guess what happened is some absorbent aluminum oxide whatever inside the actual beam element um took on water froze expanded and then burst the thing like a burst pipe so a burst water pipe so the elements started falling off and i think it's total of like three elements fell on the roof and started punching holes in the thing into the into the roof so that sucked but the only way to get it fixed is to call in a tower climber who's like four million dollars you know has four million dollars of insurance um, who can go up and change the antenna out. It's a big deal. No fault us, of the climber, just the fault of the college. Right. The the college requires quite a steep price on um, uh, tower climbers. And we found a really good guy, Don Dazzo, KA4ZA, does a lot of ham radio tower climbing and antenna insulation. He's, he's you know, really, uh, real popular. Um, I think he's from the Carolinas region, North Carolina. Ohio, um, but uh, he lives in North Carolina by... Uh, Way of Ohio, Don Dace is a friend of mine. Oh, gotcha. Um, yeah. yeah, and so he came out, and we were all real mad because the he had a million dollars insurance, which was fine, and then suddenly the university is like, "Oh, just kidding, uh, we need two million dollars." Oh, just kidding, four million dollars. Like they they were really being annoying, and I don't know what the what the deal was, but I mean they do present quite a liability if he falls or if something falls, something breaks, could cause a lot of damage. But was he able to get the four million dollars? Yeah, like he he could call, he called his guy up and he did it luckily split, but it rose our price up, it rose the whole cost of the project up. Uh, we were we had enough to pay for it, but it was really annoying that we um, didn't have like I guess the leftover budget that we were expecting, so we could do more upgrades and get more coax and that sort of stuff. So not at the fault kinda, of Don, just kind of the fault of the university. Right, we had to do it because the university wanted to. So that was annoying. So they're looking into getting a new tower and designing, maybe designing their own tilt over system, because um, they want to put up a more robust antenna as well as antennas that they can replace. Um, because that's that's a lot of fun. Like it would really help out the um, a lot of the research labs because they you know always have antennas sticking out the windows on the roof of stuff, which is always in close proximity to noise. And so it'd be really helpful if you can have a place where antennas can go up um, for testing purposes. And that's also far away from like most like man-made noise sources, like the blower motors and um, that sort of stuff. So what, was it confirmed that it was the same RFI source that caused the damage? No, but I mean, that's still speculation, but it was still, it was confirmed to be like a faulty electronics box, like some kind of faulty breaker or uh, wiring that, you know, eventually arcs. And if you don't know what we're talking about, just go listen to the old episodes. Yeah, um, I do. I pretty much have, have had a W0 triple update in almost every numbered episode. So yes, but yeah, bottom line is something. Has the noise got away though? Uh, well, yeah, when the when they, the thing caught fire, I'm sure the thing the noise went completely away because there's no power, obviously. But no, but have they tried now, using the radios again? Yet? I don't know. I haven't asked. Um, I don't know if they replaced the HVAC system completely um, or just that part or what, but there's still going to be a lot of noise because there's a, there's a solar panel and a wind turbine out just outside the window of Tripoli, and there's obviously tons and tons of uh, ballast for fluorescent lighting and... The, apparently, the comp side building puts out tons of RFI for some reason. 
All those does, computers. Does the university have any interest in quieting it or not really? Not really. Well, I mean, maybe we can make a case and say like, well, if you listen to us about this RFI problem, you could have probably found, you know, a, a, a bigger issue. This like because we were saying this is a symptom of the of what eventually was the cause of the fire. But we never took that route. We just thought, okay, well, it's a you know thirteen year old aluminum blower, and you could you could open up the 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 blower housing and see the sparks on the motor. How do you get onto the roof? Oh, you just um, well, you have to call the university police, and then you get a like faculty advisor to come up and uh, um, watch you, so you don't jump off or you know do something silly like climb the tower. You couldn't. Yeah. We, we as students couldn't climb the tower, even if we were like licensed and bonded and insured and had all the right equipment. We were still students and couldn't do it. So how, do, how would they know if a student climbed the tower? They would have to f- catch you seeing it. And there's there's been lots of fun stories in the past where people have like put Jolly Rogers up on the um, uh, Jolly Roger flag on the tower. Um, one year during St. Pat's, they put um, a green flag up there. I've heard so. There's been shenanigans, but in the last you know, 10 years, there hasn't been anything like that because we're too scared. We want to, you know, keep our, we want to get our degree and not get kicked out. (laughs) And it's just not worth it. You know, if you fall, then you get hurt and that really sucks. Yes. And then they close the club down and that, you know, that, that's what could actually really happen is, you know, you would get hurt, sure, or you would die, but they would also shut the club down and and get rid of the tower because people are climbing on it and, you know, they don't want to, they, they have the power to just be like, goodbye, (laughs) you know. I mean, they're pretty nice to let you put a tower on the roof. Right. And I really wish I knew the history because there's, there was some contention. It was actually kind of hard to do it. Um, but ultimately, they had good friends in the um, building. Did- they had good friends like in the chair, department chair. They had um, um, people who could do a lot of like um, pull a lot of strings to get it up there. So Ward Silver would be did it, – didn't Ward Silver go there? Yeah. yeah, Ward Silver uh, graduated in 72 or 74, I think. He'd have an interesting story about it. Did the club exist then? Yeah. Um, in his time, I think they were in the Rolla building, which is like a small math building. It was like one of the first buildings of the whole campus. And I, I think they moved, after the Rolla building, they moved into... To, no, Bueller, which was like a dorm or a apartment-style dorm uh-huh. kind of building. And which was like towards downtown Rolla, and then they moved into Toomey, and then they moved into Tripoli, and or into Double E, the Double E Electrical Engineering Building. Double E, the triple, the Double E. Yeah, we say the we always Double E. People who are um, um, graduates of uh, who are BS Double E's are actually BS Triple E's whenever they're in the, right. in the radio club because uh, E E, and and they picked that call sign specifically because of I Triple E. Um, I'm pretty sure. And that goes way back, so I might be making something up. But it's also really cool in CW because it's just dit, 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 which we talked about earlier. Talking about kind of station design and putting up towers and whatnot, I just thought I'd kind of throw this out there because I've been working on this lately. But I spent a good amount of time recently using something called HFTA, which is High Frequency Terrain Analysis, I want to say is what it stands for. Yeah. Um, And it's terrain analysis software. Uh, it can it can help you um, kind of pick where to uh, put Yaggies on towers uh, based on uh, terrain and uh, based off of um, based off of location. Um, and it it doesn't take much operating experience, kind of as a ham, to realize that the terrain around your station has a significant impact on the strength of the signal radiated from your antennas. Um, you know, you probably have told over time that being Figured out over time that um, being loud is good and being in a valley isn't going to get out as well as being on a ridge top, obviously. Um, but there's obvious ones like that, but there's also some unobvious things. Um, and figuring out how to kind of terrain impacts your station can be kind of complex. Uh, so N6BV, probably 15 years ago or so, um, wrote uh, some software called HFTA, uh, which models horizontal antennas like, you know, dipoles, yagis, quads. Um, at specific heights or stacked together um, and generates plots uh, that can model the end, the antenna gain at different elevation angles. um, And it can model uh, takeoffs and terrain profiles and things like that. So in other words, if you wanted to know whether or not to mount your two 40 meter uh, beam antennas, two element beam antennas, 30 feet apart 
or 50 feet apart at different then, heights at different heights then this is what this is for you i know like a majority of our listeners probably won't have this ex, you know in their you know bag That's of tricks pro- but right. it's still it brings in the question like like kind of like the electrical engineering and analysis side of ham radio like it's actually the hfta marty and i were talking about 10 minutes prior to hitting a record button he literally showed me how the whole program works it's super simple um but i mean obviously i don't have a stacked uh, array of yagis but it's still really interesting to, it, it puts in your it takes your terrain into account and like how the signal bounces from the ionosphere on the ground and then back into the ionosphere um and so you can do a lot of really cool modeling um sure and i think that's i mean it's and it's really easy to get into as well um, it's not an antenna modeler per se. Like it no, has models no, for really. gain. Like it has, you can pick from a one, a dipole or a two or three or four element, blah, blah, blah. Um, but um, for simplicity's sake, that's all it has. And that's all you really need. What you what you what, you're, what the variables are you're trying to find out is where to mount those antennas on your tower. And you can even do it for one single Yagi. So if you have the ability to mount your antenna your dipole or your three element yagi or or, or your you know X-beam. just what height should i put my dipole up yeah for like, for what you want because so, higher may not always be better yeah um, and that's kind of one of the interesting things that you'll see uh yeah. if you play with the software quite a bit um that is you know um, i can model in the software it'll allow me to say at 3.8 megahertz for example which is 80 meters going into europe uh from north america uh, if I had three different dipoles per se, and I wanted to see if my dipole at thirty feet, um, thirty feet, say, I could try it at sixty feet, and I could also try it at ninety feet, and I could model those three antennas going to Europe from my house, yeah, um, and I could see at my QTH um, that in fact the um, antenna at ninety feet would be vastly superior um, to. In that case, higher is better. Higher is better. Uh, there's a significant difference between 30 and 60 feet, and uh, somewhat of a difference between uh, 60 and uh, between um, 60 and 90 feet. Yeah, but and however, get, what if you had a 20 meter dipole? Would the 90 feet be better, or would 40 feet be better? Right. Uh, excuse me. That that was for example. That was for um, 80 meters. But at yeah. 20 meters, it gets significantly more complex. Uh, actually, the 60-foot dipole might be better sometimes. Um, and it's kind of interesting to see because at some elevation angles, sir, uh, dipoles at certain heights have big nulls. Uh, so you can check that out as well. Right. Um, and, and that's the signal at which your, sig- your the angle of which your signal is coming into your antenna. So it's not always coming directly on the horizon. And it's not always coming directly down. It's going to be between that area, between the horizon and directly above you. Right. So for, most... For- for example, the software will tell me what angle is the most typical angle. For example, the software tells me that on 20 meters uh, coming from Europe, the angle at which most signals arrive at will be between 4, 5, and 6 degrees. Mm-hmm. So I know I want to optimize my antennas to receive the best at 4, 5, and 6 degrees pointed at Europe. Yeah. And so you may be wondering, like, oh, what's a, why is this changing as you change the height of the antenna? I always thought higher was better. Well, in VHF land and in very low HF, so like 80 meters, this is true. But at the middle range, so 20 meters, 40, 10, what's happening is your signal is not only just going directly to the ionosphere, it's also bouncing off the ground. And so what happens is you get two signals that come together going one direction, the one from directly from the antenna and the one bouncing off the ground. And if the one bouncing off the ground is out of phase with the one coming from the antenna, it cancels it out. But if it's in phase, it augments it and amplifies it. So depending on how high you have that antenna changes the angle at which the signal hits the ground and comes back up, changes the angle at which you can see over the horizon. There's a lot of variables. So that's what's really going on. Right. So that's why I think a good rule of thumb, if you're not using HFT, is to put your dipole, what, a half wave above the ground? Half wave or a quarter wave, whatever you can do. Yeah, you know? and do it do it at like multiples of like a quarter wave, not like a five thirteenths wave or right. a twenty two sevenths wave, which right. if you if you know what twenty two sevenths is and you know what the day is, you'll get the joke. Ha ha ha. Hey twenty two sevenths is like a rational prior approximation. Actually yeah. it's not rational, but it's still. It's, it's, it's not rational at all. 
It's a pi, pi approximation, at least. And if you didn't figure it out, 22 divided by 7 is 3.1428, uh, which is pretty damn close to 3.14159. Yep. Um, and today is 3.14. I remember 3.1415 was a lot more fun than 3.1417. Yeah. yeah, once you started figuring out the digits, I always put it in more. Like 3.14 is the approximation you can use throughout your entire engineering career, unless you're in mechanical Until you do something important. If you're in, If you're in like frequency domain and like time domain, then it doesn't matter. But after I figured out like six digits of pi, I always put them in just because I wanted my answers to be exact, like perfectly accurate. Or you, but, just, or you just don't use decimals. Um, that's that's <laughs> that's that's the real way. Uh, use all fractions. Ugh. Use all fractions. Everybody hates fractions, but they're beautiful. Um, yeah. And I can tell you just from modeling that antenna we talked about at ten meters, for example. Uh, while we were talking, I plugged a ten meter dipole in at thirty feet, sixty feet, and ninety feet into HFTA. And I found out when I'm going towards Europe, the dipole at 90 feet is actually uh, a lot cruddier uh, than the dipole at 60 feet for a lot of the radiation angles that are kind of key. And that there's Mm -hmm. a 20 dB null at some angles that are really important. Um, And I can, the HFTA will give me a figure of merit and it says, well, the dipole at 30 feet is a 4.4. The dipole at 90 feet is a 5.4. But the dipole at sixty feet, that's a six. Um and if you, you really if you wanted to be really exact, I guess you could do like thirty three feet, which is a quarter wave. Uh, yeah. sixty six, and then I guess you do uh ninety nine, um, which would be uh it's pretty close to a hundred. But yeah, 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 the idea is you probably want to like put in your measurements at quarter wave multiples so that right. you know you can get get a, a good representation of the bounce and and just put in like numbers like random numbers too because then you can see as you're going up once you hit the quarter wave multiples you'll see a big jump or a big dip whichever way right so that's really cool that's, and, that's that's, really- and that's kind of the reason we stack uh most of the time you can i, I don't have it a way to show you uh but the one of the reasons we stack antennas is to kind of deal with uh diversity of angles right uh so you can minimize big nulls and cancel them out by stacking antennas, driving them in phase together on a tower above or below each other uh, mm-hmm. to make nulls go away. Yeah, and then you can change the angle at which you're you know, wanting to receive or send signals by switching in antennas or, right. or changing the phase between them, which I guess is more complicated. But you can just switch off one of the elements and then you have a whole new uh, takeoff angle or a whole new gain pattern that, that makes it easier to hear Russia instead of Europe or Tokyo instead of China, you know? Right. So that's a lot of fun to play with. And it um, it revolves around the whole idea of analysis, like I said, in uh, ham radio, uh, or like I said earlier, in ham radio, because you can do lots of cool stuff with free software. HFTA is free, right? No, uh, sort of free. Um, the yeah. way it works is that you have to buy it with the ARRL handbook. Um, so you pay this. Which... Up- if you were a college student and you went to the collegiate forum, you would have gotten about 70 copies of it. <laughs> you got like a thousand copies. Yeah. Um, they, they had a giveaway, but... I take that um, back. It's not the handbook. It's the antenna book. Um, but you should, uh, really, you should really have the antenna book anyways. Because it's oh, yeah. A it's a super, super good, um, good resource. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's not free. But can you get it without the handbook? Is it like cost? I am i don't think you can. Uh, but, you know, you, the 20, 30 bucks, whatever the... Uh, handbook is is very much worth uh, the software i think in my opinion oh yeah yeah it looks like on the website it says the hfta is in the handbook a companion cd in the back of the book so in the AWRL antenna handbook so if you have that pull it out and play with it yeah if the not, other the other thing you should know about hfta is that when you collect data files for it it's really, 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 really important um, that even if you're, say, 20 feet away, you get a new data file. Um, and they can be found, uh, the best place is k6tu.net. Uh, K6TU can generate them from the U.S. Geographical Survey. Yeah, and these are the actual terrain right. data. Like, Literally. That actually says what your ground is. It, That's really important in the whole in the whole calculation of like your takeoff angle because if you take off angles two degrees but there's a mountain in the way it's not going to work right so <laughs> the way you get it is you get 360 files um one for each degree um and you can plug in a heading and at that he- heading you can do analysis cool 
so there's that. And then there's also, so if you want to like actually model the antenna, there's a whole another paradigm of antenna modeling software and electromagnetic modelers. And I think one thing that a lot of people will know, one, one of them is EasyNeck and its companion, it's open free source, free so open, free and open source companion for NEC2, two, then right. that's NEC, for NEC2, the number two. Right. And these are actually antenna monitors where you can go in and... Ham quality, I guess you could say. Yeah, they're they're ham radio antenna modelers. They're not like industry grade, but they're good enough. And that's good enough for government work, if I see so myself. <laughs> <laughs> but you can go in and actually draw a dipole or draw a Yagi or draw a tape measure Yagi or draw like these, you know, any right. kind of antenna you want and segments and... And it's it's a lot more complicated than HFTA. It takes a lot more playing around, um, but in the end, it's really worth it. Um, like, I mean, I played around in college, just you know, trying to model ground plane antennas and a tape right. measure Yagi to make the be- most uh, the biggest front to back ratio. Because uh-huh. when you're doing tape measure Yagis, it's a it's a di- direction finding Yagi. So you right. want you want you don't need high gain because the gain on a three element Yagi is really wide. Like the beam is really wide, so you can't actually like pinpoint. But you, you want a narrow where, beam with and a lot of front to back, and you can compromise gain to get there. Right. If you make you can you can change it to where the very back of the antenna is a very very fine null, like a very 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 narrow null, so that you can actually use the back of the antenna to direction find whatever you're trying to look for. Um, and more accurately than the front end. So there's that. And, you know, there's tons and tons of tutorials on YouTube and stuff. And so I did that, and that got me a job at the Very Large Array. I put it on my resume. I said I knew how to use EasyNeck, which was good enough for the the radio observatory, Um, which there they had much better software. They had HFSS, which is industry-grade antenna modeling. Um, I don't know if it stands for anything. There's also, like... Fico, F E K O. There's LNEC, CST Studio. Um, there's a lot of microwave modelers that you can do like stuff in, but those cost uh, in the you know ballpark of like five thousand dollars. So right, but Fornec two is free. For Fornec two, uh, Easy Neck, you know, they're all. I out think Easy Neck, it's it's also might be in the antenna book, but yeah. I think there's like a subscription or something. Yeah, uh, Easy um, Neck A W R L is what it's called. Comes with the antenna book. Right, um, and and a lot of the if you read QST, that's how they make a lot of the antenna patterns is through EasyNeck for like if they're doing like a review of a Yagi antenna or a dipole, they'll show you like oh you know here's what an inverted V antenna pattern looks like and here's what a flat top antenna pattern looks like or here's what it looks like when you turn it into a zigzag shape and try to like you know rat it around your apartment or something. So those kind of playing with those kinds of things are really fun. In my opinion, and they're also really rewarding because yeah. at the end, like if you're looking in that, if you're in that industry, if you're an electrical engineer and you want to get into antenna like analysis and design, play with that while you're young, <laughs> for real. It's like you know one of the most important things I've done in college. In college, you never did anything like that. You we we had an antenna course where we modeled antennas using math, like using calculus and using um, like three D differential equations, but. We never got into actually modeling with software, and nowadays that's where it's at. Of course, you need to know the equations to understand like how it does if you're really in the industry, but that comes later. Just figure out how a dipole looks in Fornec 2, and right. that will give you 90% of what you need to model any antenna out there. At first, it's going to be hell. You are going to want to chuck that software out the window but fight I did. the urge. Yeah, yeah, come back. Well, it's much easier to start if you if you're watching a tutorial or you have like um um practice uh antennas. I think if you buy this or not buy, but if you get the software, it already has like tutorial like it has a dipole built in, it has some Yagi's built in, some different types of um um wire antennas. And so from there you can keep going and going. And there's lots of forums and stuff that, you know, people will help you out. If you have any questions, just let me know. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, I think this has been a lot of fun, kind of catching people up. And uh, you didn't hear us going beep, 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 (laughs) in this episode. No ready tones. But I think we had a lot of fun. So I guess we're going to put a wrap on it. Keep listening. PhasingLivePodcast.com is where you find that. Subscribe to the RSS, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, wherever you talk to us. We'd love to hear from you. Make sure you're sending us information about your interest in the giveaway. Contact at PhasingLivePodcast.com. I can be found at Marty, uh, excuse me, uh, Marty at KC1CWS.net. 
and he will tell you where he can be found. Sterling at n0ssc.com or just find me on the internet. Like you can, you can get, you can, get a you hold can of find me. us. You That's know- what's really surprising. Like, I don't know why we didn't get a lot of people uh, call in or um, um, put in their email for the giveaway. Makes me wonder if we actually have that many viewers, but we did have like a thousand something downloads, you know? So, so you know what? We forgot to why do don't this. You want, you know what? Like Sterling didn't want to do this dollars. episode. Sterling didn't talk about this episode, so I'm just going to do it this second episode. Oh, what? We didn't reach out our grubby hands, stick them in your big old pocket oh, of course. and rip out your money. Um, and if you listen this far, we appreciate you. We love you. We care about you. We care so much about you. I care about you. He's being creepy. Um, and you can show that you care about us uh, by giving <laughs> us some money. Uh, so there's two ways to do that. You can go to our website, phasinglinepodcast.com. Click that old donate button on the top right part of your screen. You can either give a one-time donation using PayPal, um, or you can do a monthly donation with Patreon. And we currently have five people giving $31 a month or so on Patreon, and we really appreciate your support. And if not, if you, do, if you don't want to donate, just we email will us. We shame you. Tweet us. No, 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 Marty. Don't say that. We won't shame them. We won't, we won't shame talk you behind their backs at all. We won't shame you. Tweet at us and email us. Let us know how you like the show. And that really gives us a lot of insight. So with that being said, I am Marty Casey, 1CWF. He is that Sterling kid. What's your call sign? In zero, Sierra, Sierra, Charlie. And uh, we're going to go bye-bye. 73, everybody. You know what I didn't talk about? What you didn't talk about? I've been operating remote as Hotel Hotel 2 Alpha Alpha. I could have given a great chat about that. Oh, next time. Next oh, time. Phasing line.